Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to today's union event. Um, my name is Aditya Dabral, St. Hughes College, and I'm going to be your treasurer for the term. Um, and with that, um, I introduce to you Mr. Ram Chandra Guha. It's an honor to have you here today. Great. Um, so I just wanted to start by um, having a look at this book of yours, perhaps your best known work, India After Gandhi, uh, very readable, and I really enjoyed having a look at it. And I just thought this um, passage that you cite, I think was really interesting and really stood out to me. So it goes like this. Um, the French writer Andre Malraux once asked Jawaharlal Nehru what had been his greatest difficulty since independence. Nehru replied, creating a just state by just means. Then he added, perhaps too, creating a secular state in a religious country. And this obviously really was striking to me given how contempt, like the contemporary relevance of kind of asking that question. So I sort of wanted to ask you um, and to, to let the wider audience know, how was that, that course of action received by Indians at the time? And would it, could you regard it as a top-down initiative by leaders of the Congress party? Or do you think there was like a popular will or a popular sentiment for India to be this expressly secular country? So it was a top-down initiative uh, by Nehru and Gandhi particularly, but by also other people in the Congress party. Uh, but the bulk of the population was not really politicized. So they didn't really have an idea of what kind of freedom would come, what shape it would take. When the British left India, they partitioned it into two countries. One was explicitly created as a Muslim homeland, that was Pakistan. And Nehru and Gandhi uh, were insisted, were insistent that citizenship would not be defined by religion, nor indeed by language. So if you look at the Indian mm -hmm. rupee note, you know, it has many, many languages and scripts on it. So linguistic and religious diversity was fundamental to the constitutional conception of the Indian Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as Nehru was around, the idea that India was home for everyone was relatively well accepted. Uh, in recent decades, of course, it has come under strong challenge. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I also, I mean, tying into that, like how Nehru was this, was this integral figure, one of the things that really came out to me in this book was how, was, was essentially, I guess, the constructedness of India, how it's a work of like immense political and social engineering. Um, so I guess I wanted, and, and you also mentioned in the book how, you know, like a lot of political scientists and contemporary observers thought India was destined to like splinter or fragment. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask like how, how has India man managed to like confound those expectations? How has it managed to be this kind of unique anomaly, like unprecedented? Um, you see, uh, the Indian constitution uh, was based on a set of values. And these values included, as I've said, linguistic and religious diversity, individual rights, gender equality. You know, India was a deeply patriarchal society and both the major religious traditions of India, Hinduism and Islam, severely discriminated against women and need to some extent still do. But the founders of the Republic were determined to assure gender equality. So we had universal adult franchise with women voting well before several European countries. Mm. Then the abolition of caste distinction, because caste were the other axis of inequality. Uh, we're a large and diverse country with many states, each state uh, with its own distinct culture, language, historical traditions. Some of the states, like for example, are uh, my own state, Karnataka, has, is as, as populous as a large European country. And so the constitution allows for this diversity and try to manage it. Mm. And uh, I think Nehru and Gandhi, and not just Nehru and Gandhi, but also B.R. Ambedkar, the great emancipator of the Dalits who helped write the Indian constitution, recognized that in diversity lay our strength. Mm. Steam learning a certain kind of homogeneity over this large, disparate, divided society would be counterproductive. Consider the case of Pakistan. Pakistan was founded on the basis of religion, but divided because of language. Since Urdu was imposed on East Pakistan when people spoke Bengali and cherished their mother tongue. Uh, so this, now on the other hand, uh, some people fear then, and more people fear now, that you won't really have Solidarity and unity unless citizens have shared identities, not so much shared values as this must be a Hindu country and this must be a Hindi speaking country. 
Hmm. So I'm speaking to you from Bangalore in South India. And there have been steady, persistent efforts by the government in power to impose Hindi, not just a Hindu view of the world, not just building grand temples, not just stigmatizing Muslims, which is a lot of what is going on, but also imposing a single language. And this comes out of a fervent ideological belief Hmm. That national unity rests on one language and one religion uniting the country. I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting because one of the one of the key passages in the book, or key sections of the book, kind of concerns linguistic diversity. And one of the interesting things I, I learned was that initially Nehru had apprehensions about dividing states on linguistic lines. Yeah. Because you know that could cultivate like subnational identities and sentiments, and maybe that could lead to secession or something. But but could, would, would you then say that that was maybe an unfounded fear and that the problem then lies with the imposition of, of Hindi or like trying to create a more monocultural way of seeing things? Do you think basically the criticisms people had at the time that, oh, if you organize states on linguistic lines, that will lead to more dissent? Do you think that those fears have not been materialized, have not been realized? Yeah. yeah. So to answer that question, one has to go back to the 19th century and well before, you know, when Nehru was a little boy, of, of four, Mahatma Gandhi, who was then not a Mahatma, but a young lawyer, went to South Africa. And he lived in South Africa two decades among the Indian diaspora. And it's living, while living in the diaspora, that Gandhi came face to face with the linguistic and religious diversity of India. Gandhi was a Gujarati speaker, but his most steadfast supporters were Tamil speakers. So he started a magazine. I mean, Oxford is among other things, I mean, Oxford is known uh, for having produced lots of prime ministers, some good and some less than good. But <laughs> Oxford is also should be known as a place that has produced many great journalists and editors of newspapers. And with those who know your university's um, uh, journalistic tradition, it will be of interest to know that when Gandhi started a newspaper in South Africa in 1903 called Indian Opinion, it was printed in four languages. In fact, four scripts, Hindi, Gujarati, and Tamil, which is the three main linguistic communities of uh, the Indian community, and English to address the ruler. So Gandhi was, was very, very clear that India, when it became free, must be a federation of many linguistic states. Every language must have the freedom to develop. And these are not dialects. These are languages with literary traditions as old, older than French and German. You know, Kannada, Tamil is arguably older even than Sanskrit. Uh, you know, uh, so that was the idea. The freedom movement promised Indians that linguistic states would be created. From the 1920s, this promise was made. The freedom movement also hoped that there would be one country. When, unfortunately, the country was divided, Nehru, who was prime minister, and Patel, who was home minister, got nervous that the country has already undergone one division on the basis of religion. And after Gandhi died, uh, was murdered, brutally murdered six months after independence, Nehru and Patel, the two major leaders, worried that linguistic states would lead to a further balkanization of India. But these fears were misplaced because language is our primary identity, Aditya. It's more primary than religion. And uh, the fact that linguistic states were created uh, and that the argument that I make in my book that they have deepened rather than hindered Indian unity is confirmed if you look across uh, uh, the Pak states to Sri Lanka, a small nation, uh, uh, otherwise a very progressive nation, but a nation that underwent a 30 year civil war because the Sinhala majority um, of the South imposed their language on the Tamil minority of the North. Yeah, it's, it seems interesting then that in well, what, what you're currently experiencing is maybe a rebuttal of that worldview. And I guess it speaks to this wider tension that we now see, which is that this kind of um, Gandhi Nehru legacy is obviously vigorously challenged by the BJP. You have Narendra Modi saying, oh, where Sadar Patel PM, we would have Kashmir. And you have other, you have some, some members of the BJP, although I don't want to act as though it's a representative view, but some even publicly praising Nathuram Godse, who assassinated Gandhi. So I guess this is kind of a historical question, but when did, you know, narratives surrounding um, India's first prime minister, who was clearly revered when he was in power at first, or had a very positive reception, how has that image now been 
challenged so robustly by, by the BJP? Was it a more gradual development or are there certain moments in history we can point towards and be like, oh, this was yeah. a precipitous decline in how people saw Nehru, for example? So there are two answers to your question, Aditya. The first is that the roots of a Hindu nationalist worldview go back to the 19th century. When the Congress was formed in 1885 as an inclusive form of representation, around the same time, you had Hindu revivalist groups determined to impose a kind of religious majoritarianism on the population. So the debate is more than 100 years old. Uh, mm. In that, from the 1920s till the 1970s, uh, Nehru and Gandhi appear to be winning the argument politically, institutionally, and socially and morally as well. Now, Nehru dies in 1964. His daughter becomes prime minister quite by accident in 1966. And then she creates what is known as the Nehru Gandhi dynasty. There's a biblical saying, which, which is as follows. The sins of the father will be visited on seven successive generations. In the case of Nehru, the sins of successive generations have been retrospectively visited on him. So he had no desire or intention to create a dynasty, Indira Gandhi did. And the dynasty culture of the Congress party stinks. Rahul Gandhi is a fifth, fifth generation dynast who is incompetent, not particularly intelligent, utterly lazy, always taking holidays, with no sense of the pulse of the Indian people, always making goof up in his speeches, in his arguments, in his rhetoric. And the only reason he heads the Congress party is that he's Nehru's great grandson. There may be a second reason, which is that the family controls the first strings of the party. But Indira, Rajiv, Sanjay, Sonia, and Rahul, their cumulative misdeeds, and you know, my book talks about some of the uh, uh, you know, uh, wrong steps they took. Indira Gandhi's imposition of the emergency, for example, in 1975. Mm -hmm. Rajiv Gandhi's capitulation to Miss Muslim clerics and fundamentalists in, uh, in 1986 have given strength to the BJP and their anti-Nehru worldview. Having said that, even if Nehru had not had incompetent, corrupt, and nepotistic descendants in politics, the BJP would still have detested Nehru because Nehru was open-minded, he was progressive, he believed in gender equality, he believed in embracing the best from the West and elsewhere in the world, and above all, he was determined that India would not be a Hindu Pakistan. Yeah, true. That, that, mm -hmm. That's all interesting. I don't want to- This is not, this is not to say, that Nehru was perfect or flawless. Of course, yeah, because I. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I, mean, yes, I, I don't. don't, I don't yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, I, I don't want to use the phrase "devil's advocate," but I, I want to say, do you think though that, like, and I guess we want to like maybe hone in on Nehru here. There are certain decisions and courses of action which he took, which now continue to like have ramifications. Like there are things and mistakes he yeah. made, which are yet to still be resolved, and things that have maybe still caused resentment. So one of the things. Um, in, in this book, which I thought was very interesting, was the idea of the uniform civil code yes. and how, so this idea of personal laws for right. Hindus and Muslims right. and how they, um, Ambedkar tried to pass through a Hindu civil code bill, but no one tried to pursue an equivalent for Muslims because there would have been a popular outcry. And in my mind, it's easy to see how you could see that and then buy into the narrative of, oh, you're appeasing yes. the Muslims, even if that leads to very violent and intolerant conclusions, which I condemn. Like it's yeah. easy to maybe see how Nehru could yeah. be perceived as being weak or soft or not actually committed to the principle of secularism, if that makes sense. Well, uh, yeah. you see, uh, the Muslims in India were very vulnerable because large numbers that stayed behind not got to Pakistan. Uh, there was a rising tide of Hindu fundamentalism. Hmm. All their progressive leaders had actually gone to Pakistan. So Nehru thought, let's reform the Hindu personal code first, give equal rights to Hindus because there's a reform movement Within the Hindu community, Hindus are more prepared because of their progressive leaders, and a time will come when we'll have a uniform civil court. You know, Nehru had many other things on his plate to attend to. He did not focus on this. After his death, and particularly when Rajiv Gandhi was prime minister in 1985, with 400 MPs in a 540-member parliament, with the Supreme Court essentially mandating a uniform civil court, with a progressive Muslim minister called Arif Muhammad Khan in his own cabinet, Batting for it, Ra Ra Rajiv Gandhi capitulated. 
But they don't get other, make other major mistakes. One which has been widely commented on is uh, promoting a kind of state stranglehold hold over the economy. This was probably required early on in Indian independence because we had, after all, been colonized by a European multinational power company. So we needed to nurture our own industry. But certainly by the late 50s, I think the economy should have been opened out. The Swatantra Party that was formed in 1959 by Nehru's former compatriot, T. Rajagopalachari, rightly criticized the license permit quota Raj that Nehru's economic policies had imposed. Uh, arguably, an uh, even greater failure of Nehru's policies was the lack of emphasis on primary education. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the enormous resources of the freedom movement and the idealism and commitment of its activists could have been turned in the first decade of Indian independence to removing inequality, uh, removing uh, illiteracy, I beg your pardon. And if you, as many socialist countries had, do, had done, uh, if you had promoted primary education and created a level playing field, hmm. uh, then maybe some of the later castes and communal conflicts would have been moderated. And a third, in my view, a third, Failure of Nehru was personal. He stayed on too long. Hmm. He did not, in 1958, after 10 years as prime minister, he wanted to retire, but he was persuaded to stay on and there was no proper succession plan. And incidentally, uh, for uh, those of you who are interested in comparative politics and international affairs, Nelson Mandela was a great admirer of Nehru. Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, is a line taken from what Nehru wrote. He greatly admired Nehru, and one of the things, one of the cautionary lessons he learned from Nehru's own political life was not to stay on too long as head of government in his country after he became, became president of South Africa, right? So, but although he made these mistakes, Nehru was a colossal figure, uh, which if, if there had been anyone else uh, other than Nehru, national unity would have been that much harder to achieve. Nehru was much more progressive uh, with regard to women's equality than any other leader of the Congress, including Gandhi. Gandhi was, uh, uh, Nehru was much more aware of the diversity of Southern India and the need not to impose Hindi on the South and the East. And Nehru recognized that merging faith with state, making this a Hindu Pakistan would deeply damage the country. So in my view, there is, no question that Nehru was a great and flawed prime minister. Mm. And, and just looking at that period in particular, the Nehru administration, one of the things you draw attention to in the book is all these very interesting kind of key players. Um, and the fact that like not, not a lot is really known about them. I think you mentioned in the book, oh, a biography is yet to be written about said person. There's like Sri Ramalu who like precipitated the Andhra Pradesh state movement, like, like load, like, civil servant figures involved in like India's first election, the organization of princely states. I suppose as a historian, who do you think in Indian history that deserves to be a biography of and which hasn't been written yet, maybe? Where, where so there are dozens, Aditya. <laughs> One of the byproducts of this book was that I co-founded the New India Foundation with the entrepreneur Nanda Nilekani which gives grants to young writers to document different aspects of our post-independence history, including biographical studies, uh, sparked by what I could not do in India after Gandhi, you know, because that book, my book has, you know, many uh, weaknesses, gaps, even though it's a thousand pages, you know, the history of India cannot be encapsulated in a thousand pages. Outside the ambit of the New India Foundation, other scholars are writing biographies. The biographical tradition is going to de further develop and many of the people I talked about are going to be researched in greater depth. The first election and the role of Sukumar Sen, uh, uh, the mathematician from Imperial College who designed India's incredibly complex uh, electoral system successfully. Uh, uh, the first election is the subject of a forthcoming book by the fine Israeli scholar Ornit Shani, uh, uh, for example, right? Uh, People have written outstanding works on economic policy in post-independent India. You know, a subject that is not treated seriously enough in the literature because 
most economic historians concentrate on colonialism. And Oxford itself, the Oxford Union itself, had a celebrated, but in my view, rather crude debate on colonialism. You know, uh, uh, but that's a, that's a separate question. So the, you know, but the economic history of post-independent India, uh, the biography, the history of the Northeast, you know, the Northeast mm. are those seven states bordering Bangladesh, Myanmar, and China, such as Nagaland, Mizoram, Assam, uh, Meghalaya, and so on, which have a very different uh, ethnic and cultural and linguistic and religious uh, profile from other parts of India, you know, and extremely neglected and condescended to by mainstream historians. So all of this, the history of independent India is full of endless possibilities for scholars. And in my view, too much emphasis is still put on the colonial period because of this kind of black and white, the evil and brutal Raj versus the noble and suffering and uh, you know, non-violently protesting India. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great initiative. I didn't know about that. That's very interesting. Um, I think I, I, I want to turn maybe to the epilogue of your book. And then from that, we can tie, we can feed into discussion about the contemporary state of India. You talk about India being a 50-50 democracy, how when it comes to elections and freedom of expression, India is broadly democratic. But if you look at politicians and institutions, not so much, maybe. I know you wrote a revived edition um, 10 years afterwards, which I don't have. But would yeah. you, would you, given current circumstances, are you tempted to change the fraction, maybe? Yes, I am, and I have done so in print. Uh, you know, I uh, live in India, and so long as India is even a partial democracy, I will not just live in India, I will write mostly in India. I very rarely write for the international press because I would like to make an impact on my own compatriots. Hmm. But one of the rare occasions when I wrote for a foreign newspaper was on the 15th of August, 2019, the 72nd anniversary of Indian independence. And this was provoked by the fact that two weeks previously, the special status, um, constitutional status that Kashmir enjoyed had been removed by the Modi government. And I wrote a piece in the Washington Post where I argued that I have downgraded my previous assessment of 2007, and I now consider India a 3070 democracy. And uh, a year and a half later, I may actually say 25 or 20 percent democracy. You know, our democratic institutions are being steadily eroded. Uh, in the second edition to my book, I described India as becoming an election only democracy. Elections are still relatively free and fair, so the ruling party commands a disproportionate uh, financial advantage in terms of funds. But though once elected for five years, the government is more or less unaccountable. Parliament mm -hmm. rarely meets, serious debates are, are not allowed, laws are passed in minutes, the courts are compromised, the media is a propagandist media. Civil society is crushed through the misuse of police and uh, other instruments to suppress and, and arrest activists. So we are not now a 50-50 democracy. We are a 20 between a 20 and a 30 percent democracy. I suppose, though, um, and I know this is somewhat paradoxical, but but the BJP enjoys immense popularity broadly, as in as as India's foremost party. So could it then be said that? There is a popular, there, there is a democratic mandate for Modi to act in a unilateral and undemocratic fashion. Would no, you say no, that's no, 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 not at all. Because, you know, uh, we are becoming an authoritarian, illiberal, populist democracy. Modi is still immensely popular. And yeah. that's partly because of his own uh, projection of his personality and partly because of the sheer incompetence and venality of the Congress party and of Rahul Gandhi, who presumes to oppose him. Right. But, you know, look at Trump. Uh, Trump lost an election and the judges he appointed followed the, their dictates of their conscience and, uh, you know, the legitimacy of the law. And look at the vigor of the media. Look at the debates in your own parliament. In, that's how a proper democracy functions. You know, the whole crisis now about the farm laws mm. uh, and the peasant protests that have been going out outside Delhi for several months. It's a complex question. One could argue that on balance, the farm laws will do good to the economy. But Modi did not allow a discussion. He just passed them through in parliament, did not even have a vote on them, did not refer them to a standing committee. 
did not discuss that them in the state, even though according to the constitution, agriculture is a state subject. You know, Aditya, it's possible uh, to run a country like Singapore, a small, largely homogeneous island country to the method of a quasi-dictator like Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew was also an enlightened dictator. He had a degree from Cambridge. Modi mocks uh, formal education. You know, he says, I don't need experts. I don't need experts in the economy, on, on, on the vaccine. If you look at the scandal by which, you know, the COVID was treated and the disregard of scientific warning. So all of this does not bode well for India. You know, a country as large and diverse needs consultation, needs accommodation, needs a spirit of give and take, needs an attentive ear uh, to what people are saying and especially what their critics are saying. So the consequences of Modi's prime ministership are manifest in a declining economy, in a divided society, in a devastated environment, and in a rapidly diminishing prestige in the world. Mm. Wow. Well, you, you made your opinion very clear. Um, very interesting, no doubt. Um, I mean, speaking of protests... I mean, but but he's, still, he's still popular. And, you know, Putin is popular. Erdogan is popular. Chavez was popular. Mugabe was popular. But they all destroyed their country. Mao was popular. I mean, the colossal cult of Mao. And look what, you know, mm. that wasn't very good for China either. Mm. So posterity might not be too kind is, is what you, you think is going to be the case. I mean, speaking of speaking of protests, I mean, obviously you have the topical um, farmers' rights protests. There were the Citizenship Amendment Act protests last year where you yourself were arrested. I mean, I think this is a very fitting segue to Gandhi, who obviously was a foremost practitioner of nonviolent protesting. I wanted to ask, as someone who's written two books on Gandhi and written just more very extensively on him, what what compelled you to write about i mean in like one of india's most striking figures and what do you think people might forget about him in contemporary discourse because obviously the days of gandhi being depicted in oscar winning films feels like a far cry and now greater attention is drawn to you know the racist comments he would have made while in south africa his sexual idiosyncrasies you know maybe a lot of the luster and appeal of gandhi in your yeah. view might might be being lost on a modern audience what would you say so I, I, what I said about Nehru also uh, applies to Gandhi. He was a great and flawed figure, mm. a greater and figure with probably more complex and visible flaws. But part of great, Gandhi's greatness was his ability to grow and learn. As a young man in Africa, he was a racist uh, because Indians were and often are racist. And he imbibed the prejudices and stereotypes of his upper caste Indian upbringing. The longer he stayed in South Africa, he shed his racism and he became a non-racist. For the last three decades of his life, he was a principled anti-racist. Uh, in close touch with great civil rights activists in the United States, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Howard Thurman, insisting that Indians must fight shoulder to shoulder with Africans against the, what was to become the apartheid regime. And his early racism was comprehensively overthrown by the second half of his life. And that's the greatness of a human being, acknowledging your mistakes, learning, and growing. Mm -hmm. He was timid in his criticisms of caste, and he became progressively more radical and direct in his criticisms of caste inequality, partly because of his engagement and debate with the great B.R. Ambedkar, whom I've referred to. If you look at his attitude to gender, he was a typical Hindu patriarch in the way he treated his wife. But two European women in South Africa, whom he knew, persuaded him that women argued with him, shaped his view, that his later mature view that women could be autonomous subjects, acting moral subjects and political subjects. And women took part not only in the Satyagraha in South Africa, but in the Indian freedom struggle. More women took part in the Congress Party's movement than in what Lenin did in Russia or Mao did in China and so on and so forth. Because of Gandhi's, uh, you know, the way in which Gandhi opened his mind about gender equality, in 1925, 
the Indian Congress had a female president, Saroji Naidu, at a time where women certainly were not going to become treasurers of the Oxford Union, let alone not even treasurer of a conservative or not even members of a Labour Party or Conservative Party Council, uh, you know, in, in your country. So that is part of Gandhi's gift. The ability to grow and evolve. Uh, and I think that's one. The other part, of course, are his, is his moral philosophy of interfaith harmony, which is crucial not just to India, not just to Pakistan, not just to Myanmar, but to the Middle East, to all over the world, to certainly to France. Uh, if you look at his commitment to nonviolence as a political strategy. Uh, and also nonviolence in discourse. Uh, the great African American civil rights activist, Congressman John Lewis, who died a few months ago, uh, was greatly inspired by Gandhi, read him as a young man, had a photograph of Gandhi on his, on, in his office, came to visit Gandhi's ashram, and when asked, What did you learn from Gandhi? said, How to disagree without being disagreeable. So nonviolence, not only in action, but also in words. So there are many, many aspects of Gandhi's personal life, his political practice, his moral, uh, uh, you know, compass, we can say, that are relevant not just to India, but to the world. The reason I spent so many years uh, writing about Gandhi, I wrote such a fat book, uh, two fat volumes, uh, which may have put off many readers, was that Gandhi does not belong to India, he belongs to the world. Mm. And in that respect, he is uh, the first Indian since the Buddha. And of course, I say this, a first South Asian since the Buddha, since Nepal also has a strong claim on, on the Buddha. The mm -hmm. first South Asian has, since, since the Buddha to have this kind of universal reach and appeal. Mm -hmm. And of course, he lived close to us, Aditya, so he knows his flaws. He wrote about his flaws. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, chroniclers and journalists have scrutinized them minutely. And my book talks about them at great length. You know, uh, it doesn't show us anything. Mm, that's true. I, I also now want to turn to your, your interest in cricket, which is also the subject of your, your most recent um, book. I'm sure you must have been pleased to see the outcome of the most recent test series uh, against Australia. But I'd just like to um, ask you to explain the personal significance of cricket in your life. And I guess to, to, to a Western audience that might not know as much about the role cricket occupies in, the Indian, in Indian cultural life, how cricket has evolved so rapidly in India over the past seven So I'll begin with the second part of your question, the role that cricket occupies in Indian life. Uh, cricket is India's greatest popular passion, even greater than our love for the Bollywood film. <laughs> there was a time 20 years ago when they went neck to neck. But if you see, for example, uh, the endorsements made by cricketers vis-a-vis -vis endorsements made by film stars, Cricket is even more important in our cultural uh, and popular imagination than film. Uh, it's also India's, more or less India's only sport. In England, soccer is your main sport. In Australia, it is Australian rules football. And cricket would come second or third. You know, rugby in New Zealand is rugby and then athletics and then cricket. So about the 10 or 12 seriously cricket playing countries in the world, it's only in India that we have a billion plus people crazy about one game. Uh, there are multiple reasons for this. In an earlier book called A Corner of a Foreign Field, which is a social history of cricket, I try to analyze sociologically why cricket so resonates with the Indian psyche and culture. This new book is a memoir, Aditya, of my life with cricket. I began, my engagement with cricket begins as a little boy of four. I had an uncle who was an outstanding cricketer, who would have played for India had he not had a physical handicap. And he mentored me, nurtured me, inculcated a passion in the game in me. Uh, you know, so I listened to it on the radio. I read about it. I played at a decent level. I played for the best college team in India. So I would have been a, a sort of like being an Oxford Blue. Uh, uh, so, and then of course I started writing about it, following it. Uh, finally, uh, briefly I was, uh, a part of a committee appointed for the Supreme Court to try and clean up Indian cricket, and we failed lamentably. But that gave me a kind of an insight from uh, the belly of the beast, as it were. Mm -hmm. And that completed a whole arc, uh, that completed the arc of my life with cricket. 
as a little boy in a small town in the Himalayan foothills, obsessed with the game, to briefly administering the game. And I thought, you know, I should write this. And I also wanted, Aditya, a release from scholarly writing. Mm -hmm. I finished the second volume of my Gandhi biography, and I wanted to write a book based on my mind and my heart, with no looking at references and footnotes, no digging in archives, and no uh, compulsion to document any, any assertion I made. You know, so it's a kind of personal literary work about my life at cricket, but it was also, I dare say, uh, a joyful escape from what scholarly writing is all about. Mm. I mean, you, you talk about how you grew up in Dehradun, and I can I can attest to someone like my nana nani basically live in Dehradun that it is very picturesque and very quaint. Um, so I see how you know that is, yeah, that's worth worth writing on at length. Um, I I wonder if um, I guess it feels a bit crude to kind of make this comparison, but almost like the the comparisons that could be drawn between cricket and politics, or like how certain issues within Indian cricket could be seen as like microcosmic of other things. I mean, what I mean by that basically is how like a lot of the criticisms people might associate with how cricket is run in terms of corruption yeah. and then be foisted onto like Indian political life. And of course, like Indian cricketers as well have immense public adulation. And sometimes that can even traverse into the political sphere. I know that Tendulkar is a member of the Rajya Sabha, although I don't know that doesn't necessarily mean much. Um, I guess I wanted, yeah, maybe to talk about the cult of personality maybe that might exist within cricket and what your thoughts might be on that. How it so there's a cult of personality in cricket and in politics and in business and in film. You know, uh, Ambedkar, who I referred to several times in the course of our conversation, in his last speech to the Constituent Assembly while presenting the draft Constitution of India, which he had helped, uh, you know, design and frame and rewrite. In his last speech, which was in November 1949, warned against hero worship in politics. He said bhakti, uh, which is the devotional worship of a god. He said bhakti in religion may be the route to the salvation of the soul. Bhakti in politics is a route to eventual dictatorship. And he warned Indians. He said, however great a person's contributions to your country, a leader's contributions, do not lay your liberties at his feet. So that would lead to the extinction of your democratic freedom. He was prescient. He anticipated Indira Gandhi. There was a cult of Indira Gandhi, particularly after our victory in the Bangladesh war, which was attributed wholly to her. And she was presented as the Hindu goddess Durga. Her party men said, Indira is India and India is Indira. And it all went to her head. And she extinguished her, extinguished her democratic freedoms of the emergency, which I remember vividly because I was a college student at the time. And now, of course, there's the cult of Modi. So, hero worship, uh, mm -hmm. uncritical exaltation of a charismatic figure comes naturally to Indians, and it has unhappy consequences in cricket, in business, in film, uh, and uh, even in institutions. You know, um, Mm -hmm. The way a charismatic vice chancellor, you know, a strong, uh, uh, decisive, uh, 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 a vice chancellor with a personality would run an Indian university is very different from how even the strongest and most charismatic vice chancellor could run Oxford. You know, mm -hmm. uh, however opinionated, smart, energetic, uh, full of herself or himself an Oxford vice chancellor is. They couldn't function without consulting the heads of colleges, heads of departments, uh, taking advice from people outside the university, such as alumni. But India is a kind of a, you know, it's kind of a great man uh, syndrome that Definitely. operates in many spheres of our life. Uh, scientific laboratories, for example, right? Um, you have a, a scientist who is very accomplished, has published great papers, but then decides he will decide what research everyone else does. You know, mm. so this kind of imposition of the will of a strong personality on all his subordinates, and it's usually him, Indira Gandhi was the exception that proved the rule, that, you know, this kind of alpha male superhero kind of syndrome is mostly men, is visibly present in all aspects of our life, and I think is not healthy for the future of India. Mm. I'm now going to turn to um, some questions that the audience has, has put in. So um, one member asks, um, 
Do you think any political party has the boldness or decisiveness to fully end caste-based reservation in India in favor of reservation based on economic conditions? Um, the short answer is no, uh, not in the short term. But having said that, I urge the questioner to reflect on the fact that caste-based prejudice is still very ubiquitous in Indian society. Uh, there's an argument to be made for reservation to be based on caste and economic status. There's an argument to be made for reservation to be restricted to one generation in the family. Today, unfortunately, if you are from a low caste and you can get into the Indian civil diplomatic corps by be, because of that, and then you can become foreign secretary and your child will also get reservation because he or she is your child. So the ways in which the system can be streamlined, uh, improved, made more transparent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so that the benefits spread more widely, but caste discrimination is still pervasive and I don't believe uh, that it can be a uh, reservation where caste is one criteria can be done away with justice. Mm -hmm. My, my, my inclination is uh, to agree, and I'm just going to interject, sorry, just because I, I had a thought about this, which is just, obviously, um, caste discrimination exists, of course, independent of, of the reservation system. But do you, is there not also part of you that might be sympathetic to the idea that were you to waive caste-based reservation, that could also reduce discrimination? I mean, of course, people discriminate for, for, for a confluence of reasons, genuine belief that they're better than others and whatnot. But but do, you, do you envisage a time when that will eventually be frittered away? You know, the only way that can happen is not by ending caste-based reservation, but by ending marriages within your caste group, your endogamous group. You know, there's no uh, reliable data on this, but at least 90% of all marriages are within the caste group. Okay. Now, so and that's my preference. If you look at the magic, matrimonial advertisements and so on, you know, you want to marry someone who is a, eats the same kind of food, worship the same God, has the same rituals, has the same imaginary lineage from some, uh, you know, caste ancestor of the distant past. So I think Ambedkar argued rightly that the way to break down caste was intermarriage. Uh, and I think, of course, that's where Indian society has lagged behind Indian politics. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Chaitanya from uh, Exeter College asks, um, your criticism of the Gandhi dynasty leading Congress is well known. How do you think a third party other than the BJP or Congress can grow to control national politics rather than the current regional dominant parties such as ARP, DMK, TMC, etc.? You see, um, the reason I'm so critical of the dynasty culture of the Congress party is not because they deserve, not just because they deserve all that criticism, but because they hold up the emergence of the other party that the questioner has asked about. They're great barriers to entry in Indian politics. You need a lot of money to have an all India party with visibility. You need support among writers, thinkers, the media. And the Congress occupies that space and Rahul Gandhi occupies that space. So Rahul Gandhi tweets something and the Indian press and the TV channels will be all about that tweet. So that space that he occupies and that privilege that he so squanders at election time by his incompetence and his, you know, uh, stupid sloganeering, which we can talk about if you need, you know, but you have to read my articles for documentation of what I'm saying, uh, is an impediment to the emergence of an All India Party. So there's an easy route to the emergence of an All India opposition to the BJP, which is a Congress without Rahul Gandhi that would bring back into its fold breakaway units such as the TMC, which controls power in West Bengal, uh, the YSR Congress, which controls power in Andhra Pradesh, Sharad Pawar's Congress, which is influential in Maharashtra. You could unite all these fragments, which broke away because of, dynasty, because of the dynasty culture. And if you did, the Congress would have more than 100 MPs in parliament instead of nearly 50. That would be the easy way to build a constructive all India opposition. The more difficult and problematic way would be to look for the third party, a new party coming out of nowhere. Aam Aadmi Party wanted to be that, but is now restricted to Delhi. It is, as the question implies, really a regional party. And uh, you know, it's 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 
it is very worrying. I mean, we are going, you know, um, and if you look at Indian democracy and where it's going, on the one side, you have, you know, I wrote a column uh, probably in October last year, which is about three demagogues, Trump, Johnson, and Modi. And I compared these three demagogues. And I said, Johnson no longer has Corbyn, the discredited Corbyn to oppose him. He has a new and focused leader of the Labour Party. And that is good for the health of UK uh, British democracy. Trump no longer has the nepotistic and discredited Hillary Clinton. He has a new face, Biden. And that will infuse a certain bigger and constructive dynamic in American democracy. Modi still has Rahul Gandhi, whom he comprehensively beat in the last two general elections. And the same face is being put forward to the Congress party for 2024. It's a matter of time before Rahul Gandhi becomes president of the Congress party again. Mm -hmm. And criticisms like such as the those I make, they may have logic and evidence behind them, but they're counterproductive because it means that Rahul Gandhi's sycophants tell him you have to disregard these guys and only you can save the Congress in India. You know, Rahul Gandhi thinks that he's that that's where he is. He's a savior. I mean, he has a completely deluded understanding of his significance. So a new party is very, very hard to think of. And I think that's why I despair uh, of uh, the future of Indian democracy. And that's why I am so unrelenting and unsparing in my criticism of the family culture of the Congress Party. Mm. It seems to me one of the things you're suggesting is that a lot of Modi's success um, comes about just by virtue of the fact that he's not Rahul Gandhi and similarly Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, I mean, also profited from weak opposition. Yeah. But I mean, I guess we could maybe invert that um, in an interesting uh, way. Let, um, me, let me just add something, uh, Aditya. You see, it's not just that. It's not just that Rahul Gandhi mm. is ineffective and lazy and unfocused. Is also a fifth generation dynamic. And India has changed. 70 years of democracy, economic growth, social churning, urbanization means that Indians are no longer so interested in who your father or grandfather was. They want to know what you have done. The culture of entitlement is slowly disappearing from Indian society. In that respect, we are becoming less feudalistic and more democratic. And ordinary Indians find the idea of fifth generation dynasty disgusting. When, when we won uh, this epic test series in Australia, much of the commentary said, we are winning because the cricketers do, you know, uh, are completely self-made. Gavaskar's son was a cricketer, but he doesn't have an automatic route to becoming a uh, captain of the Indian team. Tendulkar's son is a cricketer, and Tendulkar, Tendulkar is trying very hard to promote his son. But ultimately, it will be the wickets the son takes and the runs he makes that will take him somewhere. At this reflection on what our cricketing victory meant is an indication of how Indians detest the dynasty culture, particularly in politics and particularly in national politics. And Modi's greatest advantage is that he's self-made. He works seriously hard, but he comes from a poor working class family and he clawed his way up the political ladder through his own diligence and hard work, and of course, ambition. And I think that's really what the Congress party does not recognize. Sonia Gandhi thinks that the country belongs to her family. She's in a sense like one of the last Mughal, like the later Mughal, where the empire does not exist, but you still think uh, that one day it will come back to you. Mm. So you, so you would agree then, then for all the BJP's faults, as, a, as an institution, as a party, they're more meritocratic? Yes, yeah. at particularly at the top level. So what will happen is that sometimes, for example, Modi has a three or four ministers in his government whom he's unsure of. He needs their support. So he might give an assembly ticket in Uttar Pradesh to the son of one of the ministers. Rajnath Singh, for example, is one of these ministers I have in mind that Rajnath Singh's son will be, get a small job in Uttar Pradesh, but he'll never become prime minister, uh, chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, nor will he succeed Rajnath Singh as defense minister. So there is some amount of nepotism in the BJP, but it is controlled and relatively minor, and the top jobs in the party are always 
uh, go on the basis of rewarding hard work, competence, ability to deliver, ability to win elections. So the three top leaders of the BJP are Modi, who is prime minister, Shah, who is home minister, and Nadda, who is the party president. Modi, Shah, and Nadda, unrelated to one another. The three top leaders of the Congress party are Gandhi, Gandhi, and Nadda. <laughs> Soda Gandhi, in the, uh, Rahul Gandhi, and Priyanka Gandhi. This juxtaposition tells you all you need to know about why the BJP wins over the Congress. Hmm. Yeah, that is a striking contrast indeed. Um, I will, I'll turn to more questions from the audience. Um, yeah, we have, we have multiple questions uh, which are, are along these lines, which is basically, do you think the current illiberalism we're seeing in India is part of a cycle? Is it cyclical, keeping Indira Gandhi in mind? Or is it an irreversible slide to authoritarianism? Uh, yeah, it's very hard to say, uh, you know, uh, what, how the future will unfold. You know, I often say this when questions like legitimate and important uh, questions like this are asked, that, you know, as a historian, uh, I'm already somewhat ex exceeding my brief, my professional duty in using the past to interpret the present. Speculating into the future would make me an astrologer and, you know, completely abandon my scholarly vocation, you know, um, uh, altogether. So it's very, very hard to say. I mean, history has a way of surprising you in unpredictable ways. So clearly, uh, the BJP is not infallible. It, it's not that it can't be defeated. Uh, Modi is not immortal. Uh, economic distress uh, could turn people against the BJP. But the south of India has been resistant to Hindi imposition, for example. Uh, the diversity of our country is not something the BJP can handle. So easily, the Congress may still find a different and more credible leader than Rahul Gandhi. But at the moment, uh, it's not just the cult of personality. It's just not the majoritarian policy of the government. It's the weakening of Indian institutions that worries me. To restore the integrity and autonomy of our Supreme Court. To uh, have an independent, free-thinking media rather than the complicit and toady media we now have uh, to revive our universities, our decaying public universities. These are very, very hard tasks, and I don't know whether these are within our capability. That's what worries me more than Modi being in power, is the decline of institutions. Um, we have a question from uh, James Price, um, Worcester College, who I, he's interested to know about what you might envisage the bilateral relationship between um, India and the UK moving forward owing to Brexit and whatnot, if anything can be said about that? So, UK and India will always have decent good ties. Uh, it may interest uh, some of you to know that my next book uh, is a book about seven Westerners who joined the Indian Freedom Struggle. Oh. So the, uh, the reason I made those sarcastic remarks about your debate on the empire, Aditya, <laughs> is that I believe uh, not only that it was one-sided and crude, uh, that the remarkable thing of, about the relationship between India and the UK is actually it's much better and much more harmonious than the relationship between France and Algeria or America and Vietnam or Holland and Indonesia or any other example you take of the tortured, complex, bitter relations between an ex-colony and an ex-imperial power. So I think we have a lot in common. We have overcome the burden of our differences. Uh, but going forward, it's deluded to think, as some Brexiteers think, that you know India has a natural affinity to Britain. That's that's changed. You know, if it's more in our interest to ally with the EU, uh, we'll do that. If it's more in our interest to ally with Russia, because we need the arms from Russia, we we'll do that. So you know. Uh, I mean, people like, I'm not sure what Boris Johnson himself, but certainly some uh, India-loving conservatives think that India will prefer Indian foreign policy, Indian trade policy, Indian, you know, bilateral relations will favor England over the EU. That's highly unlikely. Mm. At the level of people-to-people -people contact, you know, your, you coming to visit your Nani and Nana and Dehradun, you know, mm. the food from South India making its way to restaurants in uh, uh, 
uh, you know, in your part of London, so that you know something more about Indian food than chicken tikka masala. You know, so listening to Indian music, wearing Indian clothes, uh, admiring our Indian cricketers, all that will happen. But in naked material terms, I don't think India will have a special relationship with Britain. Um, so Yesha from St. Anthony's asks, um, very recently, Subhash Chandra Bose has taken over the lives of the Indian Twitterati again. <laughs> but I wonder what you think about the ways both the BJP and Congress are trying to erase his memory today. And what do you think about his connections to Germany and Japan? Was it simply a tactic to achieve Indian independence? Or would you say he was a sympathizer of both governments? Oh, heavy question. <laughs> I, think, uh, uh, I think one must give him um, the benefit of a doubt. He was naive and foolish and credulous in allying uh, with the fascists uh, on the principle of uh, the enemy's enemy is my friend. Nehru knew better, but Nehru had seen what the Japanese had done in China, which was far more brutal than what the British had done in India. You know, so it's not as if, uh, uh, you know, colored colonizers are usually kinder than white colonizers. And the example of the Japanese shows that. So both were certainly credulous and nice. But having said that, he was a great patriot and absolutely committed to interfaith harmony and gender equality. The BJP, because they're fighting an important election in Bengal, are trying to appropriate him, but they'll fail because his committed commitment to interfaith harmony and gender equality and modern science and reason, you know, he was uh, is something which is totally antithetical to what the BJP said. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it's, I guess, a fitting one because it is a significant one, which is uh, Ali asks, um, do you see the India-Pakistan relationship improving in matters of security, trade and diplomacy, especially considering how many see the BJP government winning the next election too? Um, Sadly, no, uh, because Kashmir remains an outst uh, outstanding dispute. Uh, so unless there is a clear agreement where perhaps, I mean, the ideal, situation for me would be that the ceasefire line between Indian controlled Kashmir and uh, Pakistan controlled Kashmir becomes an international boundary. Uh, so the part of Kashmir that is currently within India is more effectively within India, but gets more autonomy from the center. You know, I oppose the abrogation of Article 370 because I believe that the way to retain Kashmir, our part of Kashmir within the Indian Union is to do it with dignity and honor, uh, giving dignity and honor and self-respect to the Kashmiri people, you know, which this government does not want to do. Uh, so unless that issue is resolved, sadly, you know, uh, there's going to be no progress on Indo-Pak ties. And, you know, in my book, The Commonwealth of Cricket, I look forward to a day where, uh, where India and Pakistan will play a regular bilateral cricket series named after Sachin Tendulkar. <laughs> and I say this will not happen in my lifetime. Maybe it will happen in Tendulkar's lifetime. Mm. Um, and on, on that note, I think that concludes um, this interview. It's been a, a pleasure to have you, Mr. Guha. I thought that was really thought provoking um, and really interesting. Um, yeah, just a reminder again that his latest book, The Commonwealth of Cricket, is available at all good bookstores. So do check that out. Um, I guess we can now move to the online meet and greet for those of you who have the link. Um, and I thank you all again for attending what's been a really interesting and thought provoking talk. <laughs>